Wild leprechauns have moved into Seattle and are responsible for thousands of vicious attacks. That was the uh, headline uh, of the March 17th online version of the Weekly World News. Now, 10 years ago, I, I, was, I was disappointed. The, the print edition of that tabloid went, uh, ended publication, so I no longer could read it when I was in line at the grocery store uh, because it was always amusing to read how, for example, nine U.S. senators are really space aliens or how a, a World War II fighter plane lost in 1945 had landed 60 years later. Now, I, now, I doubt leprechauns are really attacking people in Seattle. Or another recent headline that Minnie Mouse is marrying Kim Jong-un. Uh, the Weekly World News, whether in, in print or online, is blatantly fake news. It, it is not a credible source or, or trustworthy witness of the truth. <laughs> and one would have to be pretty foolish to believe something simply because it is in the Weekly World News. Well, folks, uh, there are uh, people who think that the biblical story, Christianity, is not any more likely to be true than wild leprechauns in Seattle. In fact, they view the Bible as an ancient uh, version of the Weekly World News or maybe the National Enquirer. And when they read accounts of Jesus' miracles, uh, of his resurrection from the dead, or of his promised return to earth, they say, that is totally incredible. I don't think I can possibly believe that. Well, what's the evidence that Christianity is true? Now, I'm aware that most skeptics and doubters don't show up to church on Sunday mornings, especially on Memorial Day weekend. My guess, however, is that at some time, each of us have asked in our minds, if not out loud, you know, how do I know this is all true? How do I know God really exists? How do I know that Jesus is God? How do I know that Islam isn't the way to salvation instead of Christianity? Now, these doubts can be agonizing any time, but especially uh, during a time of personal tragedy. Maybe someone close to you is killed in a car accident, or you find out you have a, a serious illness, and uh, you probably don't care if there's senators who are space aliens. Uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, you, you want to know, however the answers to certain questions. Is there really a heaven, or, or do we simply live, die, and decay? Is, is, is faith in Jesus Christ really the path to eternal life? If, if you've ever asked questions like that, there are a couple of important truths that God has revealed in the Bible we should remember. And, and the first one is simply that God does not condemn us for asking those kinds of questions. God does not condemn us for asking questions. Matthew chapter 11 tells how, how John the Baptist had been put in prison and he sends uh, some of his friends to Jesus to ask, are you really the Messiah? Remember, this is uh, the man who baptized John. I'm sorry, baptized Jesus. John had baptized Jesus and now he is having doubts that Jesus was actually who he claimed to be. And we might expect Jesus to respond, John, don't be stupid. <laughs> of course I'm the Messiah. H how can you ask a question like that? Where is your faith? Jesus instead says to John's friends, <laughs> go report to John the evidence that I am indeed the Messiah. Tell him how blind People can see, the lame can walk, lepers are clean, uh, the, the deaf can hear, and dead people are raised to life. And then Jesus turns to the crowd and says, can you believe what an idiot John the Baptist is? No, he doesn't say that. Instead he says, among those born of women, which is a rather inclusive category, 
Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. I think from that we can see that for Jesus, there's no such thing as a stupid question as long as the question is sincere. He will not condemn us for having questions and doubts. That's number one. Number two, however, is when someone has doubts and the Lord presents evidence, he expects belief. John the Baptist, Thomas, and others learn that, that doubt is not a sin, but unbelief is. It is wrong not to believe the truth when the evidence is presented. And the evidence indeed shows that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the eternal Son of God. To refuse to believe that is not only a failure of the intellect, but it's morally wrong. Doubting's okay. <laughs> unbelief. Is not. Friends, as we continue our journey through uh, the book of 1 John, we come to chapter 5, and we're going to, be going to be looking at verses 6 through 12. 1 John chapter 5, 6 through 12. If you want to use the Black Bible in the pew, it's, what, page 1023. 1 John 5, 6 through 12. In this text, uh, John, uh, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, gives us evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And rather than struggling with doubt, he, he wants us to put our trust in him and believe Christianity is true. He, he wants us to know that no matter what crisis we face, we can be confident that, that everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus is indeed a child of God. Let's just pause and pray the Lord would, would use his word to encourage and, and strengthen our faith today. Thank you, Father, for the Bible, for the word of God, for the truth it contains. We pray that this truth this morning would um, enter our ears and uh, impact our minds and then also shape our hearts and enable us to uh, believe and embrace the truth. Help me to speak clearly today, Father. Help my friends to listen intently as we hear you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, we're going to look at the evidence that John presents. And, and today, I, uh, how about, why don't you pretend you're, you're a jury? Some of you have experienced as jurors, yet uh, even if you're a rookie, you'll do just fine. And as you're listening, we, we each should be asking ourselves, is the evidence John presents persuasive? You know, it's interesting. John doesn't use theistic proofs or, or philosophical arguments in his, in his case for Christianity. Rather, his focus is simply upon Jesus. And he calls his first witness, none other than God himself. Verse 9, if we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given about his son. This is the ultimate expert witness of all time. The credibility and credentials of witnesses uh, is important. At a murder trial, both sides will often call brilliant, somewhat eccentric scientists uh, as expert witnesses to sort through DNA evidence. Yet no witness could possibly have better credentials and, and be more credible than God. If we believe human testimony, we must certainly believe God's testimony, is what John is saying. And yet, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's not just the credibility of one witness that's important. The, the number of witnesses also matters. You know, if, if one of you told me that you heard a weather report that it's going to snow in Chisholm tomorrow, I would wonder if maybe that was a dream you had. Now, if, if three people told me they heard that weather report, I, I, at least I believe what, what, that's what the weather person said. I would still hope that that was not going to be the case. In the Old Testament, if someone was to be convicted of a crime, one witness was not enough. 
There had to be at least two or three witnesses. And John says, I have three additional witnesses, and they are all in agreement. Verses 7 8. For there are three that testify the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Almost everyone agrees that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. But uh, what about the water and the blood? Uh, Augustine suggests that John is referring to the water and blood which flowed from Jesus' side. So, so the verse then is simply speaking of the crucifixion. That testifies to who Jesus is. Uh, Luther and Calvin uh, both said that the water and blood are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, others say that the water is Jesus' birth and the blood his death. Uh, I'm pretty convinced the water refers to Jesus' baptism and the blood to his crucifixion, and yes, the Spirit to the Holy Spirit. Now, I realize that you might be a little bit confused at this point if you're reading the King James Version or the New King James Version, because it says, it reads a little bit differently. New, New King James Version, for example, says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, almost all other English Bibles make no mention of the, the triune heavenly witnesses, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Now, let me assure you that I, I certainly believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe God is, is three persons in one being, and almost all Bible translators believe that as well. Uh, the New Testament clearly teaches the Trinity even without this passage, and the reason why almost all modern versions of the Bible do not include the heavenly witnesses is because the evidence is strong that John did not write that sentence in his letter. In fact, the New King James Version note admits that. It was most likely added by a 5th century writer to a Latin text, and then in the 16th century, it was included by Erasmus when he compiled the, the Greek text, which was used to translate the King James Version. But my main point is not having that sentence in the Bible in no way changes the New Testament teaching about the triune God, nor does it weaken John's case for believing in Jesus Christ. So, is Jesus really God's son? Is he really Messiah and Lord? John says, well, consider this threefold testimony. When John was baptized, I'm sorry, when, when John baptized Jesus in water, there was a voice from heaven which said, Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son. Clearly, this is testimony that Jesus is God's son. Then, when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, darkness covered the earth. And the veil of the temple was ripped in two. The Roman centurion, a, a, a pagan, said, Surely this man is the Son of God. Again, clear evidence that Jesus is truly God's Son and Messiah. And then number three, we have the Holy Spirit, who Jesus says, John 16, 13, will guide the disciples into all truth. And the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write the Gospels and proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus. He testifies that Jesus is truly the Messiah, the Son of God. So through two historical events, Jesus' baptism and crucifixion, and through the testimony of the Holy Spirit, God's proclamation is loud and clear. This is my Son. This is Messiah. He is the Savior. He is Lord. Turn to him. Put your trust in him. Believe the gospel, the great news of Jesus Christ. At this point, John might say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, note that I have not asked you to blindly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I haven't asked you to simply take a leap over the cliff and, and, and just hope that there's a, a ledge below on, on which you can land. 
No, I, I'm asking you, yes, kind of to take a leap of faith because God says, I have told you and I have shown you that there is indeed a ledge just three feet below and the testimony that God has given concerning Jesus is sufficient reason to believe. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you, you must make your choice. Do you believe what God says? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son and Savior? Friends, as we make that decision, we must decide whether or not we're going to believe God's testimony concerning Jesus. Now, as human beings, it's kind of interesting what we choose to believe and what we don't, don't believe. Um, you might go to a, a college classroom and the professor will tell you that there are 581,678,434,341 stars in the universe and most of you would simply believe him. And yet if someone put up a sign which said, wet paint, most of you would have to test it for yourselves just to make sure. So, so, so John highlights the importance of the decision we need to make by focusing on the consequences of choosing not to believe what God has said about Jesus the Messiah. Verse 10, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. Now, there are a lot of people who think they're, they're good folks even though they don't believe in Jesus. They may uh, claim to obey God's commands even though they don't believe Jesus is God's son. Yet that's kind of like saying, uh, oh, my, my watch runs perfectly, it just doesn't tell the right time. Not believing in Jesus offends God in the most basic way by calling God a liar. Maybe you remember the, the media uproar of a few years ago when, when Congressman Joe Wilson called President Obama a liar. Uh, according to Louis L'Amour, anyway, it was okay uh, to call someone all sorts of nasty names in the Old West, but if you called him a liar, that would be just cause for that person to pull out a gun and shoot you. Few things are more painful than having someone that you love and care about tell you that he or she doesn't believe you. And friends, it's no surprise that we offend God if we call him a liar. As a result, refusing to believe God's testimony has a very serious consequence. Verse 12, the one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that, that's not a threat. It, it's a fact. If we f refuse to believe Jesus is God's Son, we will not have life. Oh yeah, we'll continue to breathe air and, and drink water and eat food, but we will be a spiritual corpse. Uh, we'll still be able to work hard and play hard and party hard and, and have a lot of fun, but we will be spiritually dead. And for now, that means we are alienated from God. We don't have a relationship with him. We might believe God is there, but, but we can't really relate to him as, as our father except through Jesus Christ. And, and worst of all, being spiritually dead brings Eternal consequences. Terrible eternal consequences. Those who do not have the Son of God, who refuse to believe in him, will suffer eternal hell. Some of you might be objecting, Pastor Dan, that you make it sound so black and white. Aren't these things a little, a little more gray? Well, friends, I would simply remind you that, that I'm not making it sound that way. This is, this is the Apostle John's statement. It's what God says to us through his word. We have to choose to either believe that or not believe it. 
At, at some trials, the, the very life of the defendant hangs on the decision of the jury. Today, John says, the life of the jury hangs on the decision it makes about Jesus Christ. What, what happens if you choose to believe in Jesus? Well, John would, would answer. He'd say, first of all, I'd remind you that your choice to believe in Jesus Christ is only because of God's grace that he enables you to do so. If left on our own, we would all choose to call God a liar. Yet if by God's grace we choose to believe, he says, we then have eternal life. Verse 11, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And folks, having eternal life includes the promise and hope of heaven. It means dwelling in the new heaven and earth described in Revelations 21 and 22. That is a life that never ends. When we've been there 10,000 years, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That, that, that's a wonderful promise, a hope that we should never take for granted. Yet if we are a believer in Jesus Christ, that eternal life begins right now. It, it goes into effect immediately. Uh, belief in Jesus changes, uh, yes, the quantity of life, but also the quality of life that we experience. We are now able to live in fellowship with God, and life can have a purpose and can have hope, and we can have joy. Verse 10, the one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within him. Those of us who believe in Jesus Christ have, have security. God gives us internal confidence that everything he has said is true. And that's, that will enable us to overcome our struggles with doubt. If we choose to believe, I'm confident the Lord will show us that the gospel is true. Uh, John Calvin put it this way. I guess this, I, I paraphrase this a little. He says, when a person who is not a Christian looks at the evidence for Christianity, it, it will appear kind of fuzzy and, and blurry and, and not really be very compelling. But when, by God's grace and spirit, that person uh, believes and puts on that, those spectacles of faith, then all of a sudden he's able to see clearly. She knows that Christianity is true. She knows that Jesus is indeed God's Son and Savior. Or to use a, a courtroom analogy, a, a non-Christian is able to see that the preponderance of the evidence points to the truth of Christianity and yet, when that person believes, he's then able to see that the evidence shows that Christianity is true beyond reasonable doubt. And so a 51% certainty becomes a 99% certainty. We then know what God has said is true. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is your responsibility to render a verdict about Jesus Christ. Is he the eternal Son of God? Is he the Messiah, Savior, and Lord? Is he worthy of your trust and confidence? Should each of us seek to honor and obey him in every aspect of our lives? Now, most of us in this room answer those questions with a resounding yes. And if that's your response, praise God, that's wonderful. I would simply urge you to share the reasons why you believe in Jesus with other people. 
you believe the witnesses and the testimony that, that God has given about Jesus. And thus, it, it, now it's your turn to take the witness stand and testify to others that the gospel, the great news of Jesus, is true. It's your turn to tell others that Jesus is the source of meaning, joy, and salvation. Now, I know the idea of, of talking to other people about our, our Christian faith makes many of us uncomfortable. You know, we don't want to be some religious fanatic. But, but I'm not suggesting you do anything weird. Just, just, just be honest. Just be honest with others about your belief in Jesus Christ. Be willing to tell your, your, your family and other relatives and, and friends and neighbors, people at work and, and school, what trusting in Jesus means for your life. Friends, if, if you are a believer in Jesus, I want you to pray and ask God to give you an opportunity this week to testify to the truth about Jesus with someone who is not a believer in Christ. Pray that God would give you that opportunity. That's all I want you to Just ask for the opportunity. And, and then when he provides that opportunity, strive to be bold but gentle as you testify to the truth about Jesus Christ. Now, I, I suspect there might still be some here who are a, a little uncertain about what verdict to choose. Yeah, you, 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 you're hearing what I'm saying, but, but, but you're not sure whether Jesus is really that important. Is he really the Son of God, really the Savior and Lord? And you haven't really decided whether you should put your trust in him. Well, friends, if that's the boat you're in, I would simply challenge you to carefully consider the evidence. I realize that some of you are so busy with your, with your job and uh, pursuing education, and you've got all these family activities, you have hobbies, you have sports, that, that you really haven't taken time to think about who Jesus is and what he's done. In fact, you may almost, uh, maybe almost intentionally keeping yourself busy focusing on other things just so you don't have to think about Jesus and about those ultimate questions of life. <laughs> questions like, you know, why am I here? Where am I going? What's going to happen to me after I die? But folks, life is more than jobs, education, family activities, hobbies, and sports. <laughs> Those other questions are so important. Because sometime your life on this planet is going to come to an end. That's a, a cold, hard fact. And as we were reminded last week, none of us know when that's going to happen. It might be before this day is over for any one of us. And yet this life is not all there is. And nothing is more important than our eternal destiny. And the truth is that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how good of a person you've been or how rotten a person you've been, each of us needs that amazing grace, that eternal salvation that God freely offers to those who turn to Jesus Christ. You may not realize it, but, but that is reality. So again, friend, what, what is your verdict on Jesus? Do you believe he's the eternal Son of God? Do you believe he is Savior and Lord? If so, I urge you by God's grace to turn to him, place your trust in him, by faith receive and experience his amazing and saving grace. If you're not sure still <laughs> about this, please give me a call. We can talk more. Because in the end, each one of us has to decide about Jesus. May the Lord help you to reach the right verdict.